So before we get into today's video, I want to give a shout out to a must read for any Christian. It's the book Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. Lewis is a brilliant ex-atheist intellectual. He became a Christian and actually one of the greatest defenders of the faith. He brings a brilliant yet easy to read and understand depth to the Christian faith. His book is really not specific to any denomination, but rather explores the ideas that generally unite all Christians. It's really a must read. If you have never read this book, go to Amazon right now and look up Mere Christianity and either get an audio or paper copy today. Good evening, everybody. I am here with my good friend, uh, Luke Hansen. Luke, how are you doing today? Doing good. I'm interested in seeing what you have for me today. Yeah, yeah. So I wanted to uh, share uh, an example that I'm, I'm kind of doing this as a maybe as an epilogue to our conversation with Nuance Ho or maybe as a follow up to it. But it's just an example that we didn't talk about in the video that I think is a very powerful one. Uh, and it's this idea of uh, it, it's called the uh, I call it the sandwich analogy. Um, and in my mind, it's it's an analogy that I'm going to pull up a slide here. Um, I think it's an analogy that I think shows the problem with the leftist mindset and specifically talking about the leftism that believes in utilizing the power of the state, the coercion of the state to sort of get people to do the right thing, right? Um, so. I have this example of the um, the parable of the sandwich, and it, it's actually I'm going to read from a book that talks about this idea. It's it's uh, I believe the book was Letters to a Young Conservative. I think is what it's from. I did change a little bit of the language to modernize it a little bit, so I mentioned Biden in this instead of Obama because this was written during the Obama era. But um, this is this is what it talks about, and I want to get your thoughts on it once after I read this this story. So imagine that I'm walking along the riverbank with a guy who is hungry. I'm eating a sandwich. He asked me to share it with him, and I do so. Now, this is a virtuous transaction. I have done a good deed, and he is appropriately appreciative. Perhaps in the future, if he has a sandwich, he will share some with some other needy guy. But this virtuous transaction is completely corrupted when it is brought about by the forcible intervention of the government. Now envision the same scenario as above, but this time Joe Biden shows up on a white horse and dismounts. He points a gun to my head and compels me to share my sandwich. Now I have not done a good deed since I only shared my sandwich under duress. I gave not out of charity, but out of fear. The receiver is not grateful to me, why should he be? He knows that I didn't give voluntarily, so the free sandwich does not provoke a feeling of appreciation. Indeed, it is more likely to instill a feeling of entitlement. You know, they might say something like, well, I'm still hungry. Why am I only getting half a sandwich? Right? Um, so even though the results are the same, and I and the other guy each end up with half a sandwich, the morality has been completely stripped out of the transaction. But this does not take into account the most invidious aspect of the transaction, the role played by Biden. Upon reflection, his actions are not only unjust, they're criminal. If he were a private individual instead of a government agent, I would have called the authorities and he would have been arrested for assault, extortion, and theft. Yet Biden somehow, uh, yet Biden some, uh, yet Biden and his people somehow think that this is social justice. I am supposed to be the greedy and selfish one for possessing a sandwich, and he is wonderfully compassionate for taking half my sandwich by force and giving it to someone else. Notice that through this process, the recipient of the sandwich is not grateful to me, but to Biden. Biden becomes the provider of my sandwich. In fact, Biden is the one who gains the most from the outcome. His gain is not merely the half a sandwich he took. Rather, it is the allegiance of the person he gave the sandwich to. That guy is now indebted to Biden and more likely to vote for him. While the other man gains a meal, Biden gains 
power. What are your thoughts? Uh, that is exactly right, <laughs> I think. And this actually reminds me of kind of a more practical application of my, of my life. And maybe this is just partly my stubbornness. But sometimes in my mind in the morning, I would decide I'm going to try to be a good person today. This is when I was still living at home, you know, high school age level. You know what? After school, maybe middle school, you know, what? after school, I think I'll clean my room. It's a little messy and I would like to have order and be productive, have productivity in my life. Perfect. Go to school, come home, going to clean my room. When I arrive home from school or on the car on the way home from school, my mom says, Luke, you need to clean your room today. And then I get very frustrated with my mom because now I, I was going to do it already. But now I'm like, ah, oh, mom. Now I, I'm not like using my own agency as much because now this there's kind of the coercive, although moral and proper uh, force of parent parenting on my decisions. And, and not like my parents were super overbearing and comp compulsive, but it's just kind of a funny thing that that's what my brain, the, kind of the path that it would take is I would mm -hmm. get mad about being told or put under duress to do something that was good that I already was planning on doing. Cause I felt like I <laughs> lost some of my agency. Um, and I kind of like lost some of the goodness of that action that I was going to perform by being asked to do it by somebody who had power and authority over me. Absolutely. And so it changes the willingness of people to even give to charity and mm -hmm. to do things for others. Cause you say, well, the government already does that. There's that well, famous here's the thing. Oh, go ahead. You have not addressed the problem. The problem was not that the guy was hungry. That wasn't the issue. The problem was that we're living in a fallen world in which people are, and this is assuming that the maybe the guy, you know, no fault of his own, maybe coercive, maybe unjust things did happen. Maybe exploitative things did happen. Yeah. In the maybe the an maybe your that... ancestors, maybe your ancestors mistreated his ancestors. <laughs> yes, it, it's possible. Maybe it's through no fault of his own. He's in the situation. And in a perfect society, in a Zion society, he wouldn't be in that situation. But it's not because it's the fact that he doesn't have a sandwich isn't the problem. It's the the human heart, like we talked about with Alexander Solzhenis, Solzhenitskin, Solzhenitskin. Um, Solzhenitskin. That's the problem. <laughs> Solzhenitskin. That's the problem. <laughs> And so by giving him the sandwich, you've in some ways compounded the problem because you've given it that veneer of being solved, when in reality, whatever vices, pride, selfishness, greed, envy um, resulted from that man not having a sandwich when he was in need, those factors still exist. And they've probably even been exacerbated by this new course of immoral force of government confiscating property and redistributing it to other people for that uh, attainment of power. And I think this goes back to John Adams, which is this um, people can only be, this constitution can only govern a moral uh, and religious people because any system of government can it has the possibilities and the motivations for those at the head of government to accrue more power to themselves. And without a moral yes. and religious people who are going to place checks upon that through disciplined virtue, you're going to create these cycles. And there's more than just the example that you give where people who are kind of living virtue free and they just want to vote to have Christmas 20 times a year for themselves then that can be the unjust accrual of power by the governed. And then here's the problem. Uh, that which can, that which has the power to give has the power to take away. And so Biden's only giving you the sandwich because you're going to give him votes. But it's not unreasonable that in the future, the government, maybe not Biden, but someone else that comes along later, will have accrued enough power that now they don't need your votes anymore. And now how are you going to get your sandwich? Yeah. Now that you've given them, you gave them the power to give it to you. You've also given them the power to take it away from you. Yeah. And then the whole power, the whole game is about who has the power. It's all about who, who is the one who holds the gun and politics become the center of everything. Whereas when politics become less relevant as people are more virtuous, the more people share their sandwiches voluntarily, the less people are even tempted to do that. 
right? And then also, we have to just, from a Christian perspective, notice down there at the bottom, force. You're forcing other people to do things. And the government does that through violent means, ultimately. A Christian has to ask themselves, under what circumstances is violent force justified? In my mind, that is the political question for a Christian. Christians mm -hmm. do believe that violent force can be justified for certain things. But that has to be the way a Christian frames the entire political everything. Because you're asking yourself when you're saying, should the government do X? You're saying, should we use violent force to achieve this purpose? Because the only reason that this thing that the government is doing is happening it, is because they are using force to make people do things they wouldn't do freely if you just left them alone. So that has to be the calculus. So my political philosophy, which emerges from my... Uh, my religious uh, view emerges from the question of under what condition is force justified. That's my entire political philosophy is based on that question because that's what government is. That's what politics is. It's human beings fighting over the gun of government and deciding who we're going to point it at and why. And mm -hmm. Christians should be like, wait a minute, pointing guns at people? Like, we're really uncomfortable about that. <laughs> like, I don't want to point guns at people. And so the people that are like fighting to get the gun and talking about the people they really want to point it at, I'm like, whoa. That's why I think, because we believe in letting people be, but we also believe in defending people from those who would do them harm. And so I just think that the problem is, is that people don't actually frame the conversation properly. They're not asking the right question. Like they don't presuppose and they should presuppose or, or understand that the government is an instrument of force and violence. And then that, then it's like, oh, well, wait a minute. Maybe I need to think twice about this. Maybe we should, maybe we should try and limit the amount of violent force that we're using. And all of a sudden you start talking like, you know, like a, a, a classical liberal where you're like, uh, maybe the king shouldn't just be able to do whatever he wants. Mm -hmm. So Anyway, but then the, the question is, uh, so how do you render into Caesar that which is Caesar's? Like, where is, where is the line of submission to government? I have a, I have a very as a Latter Day Saint. I have a very interesting uh, thing about that quote, which I think is taken out of context. Here's my question for you: mm -hmm. What belongs to Caesar? What belongs to Caesar? In that context, the coin belonged to Caesar because of. I would disagree. I would say what Jesus oh. is saying, Jesus was doing something, in my opinion, this is my take on it. I could be wrong. People are going to debate me on this. Okay. Maybe it's the wrong exegesis. But my take on that, what Jesus is doing is he's actually playing a trick to get out of the Roman, because they wanted to put him in a bad spot. They want him to say something bad about Caesar, right? Mm -hmm. Well, Jesus, Jesus subtly says that Caesar doesn't own anything. And, but he does it in a way that tricks the centurion into thinking that he is talking about the coin belonging to Caesar. What Caesar, what he's saying is, is, is render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's and render unto God that which is God's. Well, what belongs but to Caesar? Coin, what belongs to God? But the coin bearing the image of Caesar who bears the image of Christ or bears the image of God, um, the line goes back to God. So I, I and, and the, now here's another way of interpreting it. That's why I've given one potential one. Another way mm -hmm. to interpret it is, is that Jesus, my, so I, another great lesson in po my political worldview and the way that I view it is I examine Jesus relationship to Caesar. Caesar represents the government in the time of, 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 uh, of Jesus. And not only that, he represents one of the most oppressive governments in human history, <laughs> like no rights for you. And totally blasphemous blaspheming god and the and the jews were the ones expecting the savior's going to show up and just like chop off some roman heads and here we go caesar's going down and jesus was very controversial because he didn't confront caesar directly he confronted him indirectly and jesus attitude towards caesar in my opinion was very pragmatic and in my opinion that is what the church does the church is not actually politically neutral 
it no. it doesn't endorse no. certain political parties, but to say that they are truly politically neutral means that the church has a neutral stance on the use of violent force. Like the church is not neutral about the use of violence to get your way. And the church has spoken out about certain forms of government very strongly. Now, within the frame, of, but, but so the church looks at it and says, look, I, and I believe this is what Jesus did with, with Caesar, was he said, look, I'm going to subvert you, but I'm going to do it in a way, I'm going to play your game, I'm going to render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, but the goal here isn't to empower Caesar. The goal is to bring down Caesar. He's the bad guy in this equation. Remember, Caesar is the bad guy in the Roman world, in Jesus' world. And the great literal historical lesson is that Jesus, the crucified slave, essentially brought down the Roman Empire. And that's what Nietzsche points out. And the vindication of history is that Jesus is the one who we all sing praises to and not Caesar. And so there's a power in the subversive nature of the Christian message, which is to disempower those like Caesar by making them irrelevant. And so what that, do you say is the 21st century 2023 application of doing that to the government? Take care of ourselves and don't depend on the government and organize ourselves okay. and our families and our lives so that we don't need them. And then tell them to pound sand and don't participate in their systems as much as possible <laughs> whenever they're involved in, in unrighteous things. And so we should be very politically active in opposing the use of violent force that doesn't meet the justification for that force. And we should be avoiding, uh, we should be working to limit the power of the state all the time as Latter-day Saints, because the state ultimately is, um, well, I can't say that always. I, it, we should be limiting any illegitimate use of state power. And the legitimacy of state power needs to be measured against violent force and the justified use of it. Mm -hmm. I believe this quote is also from Milton Freeman, and Thomas Sowell might have said something similar to this, but tyrannies are usually not ushered in under the we're, we're going to come into your houses and take the stuff we don't like and, and all that stuff. It's you're going to give us this power to solve this crisis, to guarantee these freedoms, these rights to achieve all these good things. And the kind of deeper insidiousness of it is it might, the people who are spreading that message, trying to get you to vote for those things actually might believe it. Like they might actually believe as good oh, yeah. intents, but it's, it's just not going to happen. Like it's, it's, and King Benjamin laid this out. And, and I think the Book of Mormon as a tool for our day, specifically laid out for our day, applies to government. And I we can't miss the main message of Christ, but I think there's some important lessons to pull out of it because it actually spends a good amount of time explaining the government and like how the governing system helped and hurt the people at various times. And what mm -hmm. Benjamin points out is, uh, yeah, I've I've been a good king and I have every reason to guess that my son might be a good king, but that's no guarantee for the future in perpetuity. And, and that's kind of the conservative perspective coming in. It's how do we maintain this system throughout time? How do we maintain the good things that we have throughout time? So he kind of introduced a proto constitution. There was, there was this less developed idea of the, checks and balances and power not residing in one individual and the fact that the people who govern you are going to be just as corrupt and maybe even more corrupt because of the power the corrupting nature of power over the the people mm -hmm. and so they set up this new government system that worked decently well for an amount of time until the people became uh, not a virtuous people anymore so yeah. i think we can look to that that as an example but I actually yeah. have one more question because I kind of have a theory that you mentioned with the, the church. The church is not politically neutral. The church has a current pragmatic stance of mostly uh, political neutrality in all but a few cases. Mm -hmm. I think that that is not going to maintain even for a lifetime. I think there is going to come a point when the church is going to be a little more involved and it might irk some people. It might, it will, it will, it will cause some friction 
and people might have a little bit of a rude awakening because they didn't quite understand what the church's role in relation to government was, and they didn't realize that it was a kind of more uh, temporary, pragmatic stance, and then maybe in the future the pragmatic stance changes to something else and it becomes more well, viable and, for the church to get involved. Well, and, and do, you, the, do you think that's a good theory? That's my Yeah, question. yeah, no, I, I think the way things are going, the reason that we're talking so much about religious liberty is that the church is trying to stem the tide of Caesar going on a rampage <laughs> because mm -hmm. Caesar seems to be getting more and more ornery these days when it comes to religious institutions. And so the church is trying to keep Caesar away. Think back, we're about to get into the book of Acts and come follow me. And I've been studying uh, the early Christians, and it's very interesting to see what happens. What happened to Paul was the same thing that uh, Pilate did to Jesus. They would bring them in and say, these guys are political revolutionaries. And they would say, no, we just have this religious message. And then the, the leaders would look at them and go, yeah, you know, you guys are talking about like some weird kingdom of, like, you don't have any soldiers or anything like that. No, no, we're not doing that. We're not violent. And they're like, well, you're not, you're all kind of using this political language, but you're not like, you don't have any violent force. So I'm not worried about you, but that's sort of the thing. That's, that's exactly right. Like we're going to take you down, but we're not going to use swords to do it. We're going to mm -hmm. rob people of even caring about you. And they're going to sniff out your disgusting, uh, evil power grabbing because the greatest power of all is the power of love. And that's what we're going to spread throughout the world so that we don't, and when you love someone, you don't force them to do things. You don't coerce them. And so, but again, they were very pragmatic. They'd be brought before these authorities and they wouldn't be like, yeah, we're trying to subvert you guys, but here's how we're doing it. It was, it was, it was, they had to keep Caesar off their back. And I think the church will do that. Um, but I, I agree, once things get to a certain point, the church has to kind of stick up for itself to try its best to like avoid the rage of Caesar. Um, mm -hmm. Because the greatest and that might threat... come as the shock to some members. Well, what's funny Even is though when you dig into it a little more, it maybe it shouldn't actually come as a shock. The greatest threat to our church historically, both in the time of Jesus and in the time of our day in, in the modern era. Uh, and even you could say the Christian movement all along has been Caesar. The reason we don't have missionaries in certain parts of the world is because of Caesar. It's mm -hmm. because of it's because of government. Um, the government has the the government nearly crushed our church <laughs> in the late 1800s when they confiscated the property and like like Caesar has immense power. Like if we go full communist, like we all have to go like underground and like hide. And try and like, you know, like they did in the under Roman persecution kind yeah. of stuff. You know what or I mean? Like communism. <laughs> yeah. Or under yeah. communism. Like, like there are legit, the, the threat of Caesar to us existentially is insane. And so the well, church I have has a, I have a, personal a very example. fine line. I, I went to Ghana on my mission and, you know, Ghana as it's a, it's a smaller country relative to the United States, as most countries are. Um, Ghana's not that much of an economic powerhouse, so the government doesn't have that much teeth. There's a lot of corruption, and so it seems kind of like a, a pretty weak institution. And the people of Ghana are extremely open and accepting of the gospel and very kind of like religiously tolerant and all that. Yet for, gosh, what was it, 10 or so years, the government of Ghana implemented the freeze the freeze on mission. That's what they call it of missionaries coming to the uh, state mm. and preaching the gospel there. And people had to kind of like, I don't know if it was illegal to meet, but to evangelize at least was prohibited. And that's coming from like a very open, religiously open, kind of a weak government society. Yeah. Imagine what stronger things like the United States might be able to implement on its people. If there aren't those internal checks in place. Absolutely. And, and what's, what's funny though, and I wanted to bring this point up as well. And it's kind of the last thing that I'll bring up, um, is, and it's coming at the church. Uh, Greg Matson and I talked, uh, recently, and he was talking about how this stuff, he thinks it's just coming at the church hard through the academy is liberation theology and liberation theology. Uh, for those of you who don't know, is the idea that, um, 
it's essentially the use of the state to create Zion. It's the use of social agitation and movement to try and create Zion from the outside. Now it it's based again on a good yearning, the yearning for the right society, but it casts Jesus Christ primarily. It's the same as a political savior. It's the, it's the same mistake that the Jews made when Jesus showed up, they expected a political Messiah and there is a political and social aspect to what Jesus Christ brought to transform the world and create Zion. Um, but like, just listen to this language in this, in this recent book, uh, that, that I've been reading, um, it's called, and there was no poor among them, liberation, salvation, uh, and the meaning and the meaning of the restoration. This book is basically saying that the meaning of the restoration is the restoration of Zion, which is then brought to the world through liberation, right? The same language as sort of the critical theorists. And here's what it says. It says, if salvation is about returning to live with God in the next life, it doesn't really matter how much the current world is, or, or how much how the current world is structured. But if salvation is about liberating people from oppression and the things that make them unable to live this life to the fullest, uh, I, I'm sorry, I missed that part. But but basically, they're they're making that same point, right? That the that uh, that that Zelf on the shelf was right. It's like salvation isn't you know. Christ isn't just talking about the next world. That makes this world unimportant. But as they say, the world needs salvation now. The tears and blood of millions cry out from the earth for justice, for liberation, for salvation. And I have come to feel convicted and are convinced and convicted of this responsibility so that we may work together to bring to pass the vision of the restoration God has for the world to build Zion communities, communities of love and, uh, uh sorry, I can't see that. Oops. And divine relationship where all may flourish and there are no poor among them. This is salvation. And this book is very much talking about bringing down capitalism. And it is a very politically left wing book that basically advocates for a type of, of Marxist ideology where liberation, again, there's that word liberate people. This is the uh, critical theory term. It's liberate people from the circumstances that, that enslave them rather than telling them where the message should be. We need to transform the world by bringing people the doctrine of Christ so that they can start and change from the inside out, right? Like Solzhenitsyn said, and Zion will emerge in the world. Rather than Zion being imposed, Zion emerges. And that is that is the difference between Zion, the doctrine of Christ, and the restoration, and liberation theology, which now is making its way into the church through the academic system and the leftists that, that sort of embrace, that, that take leftism and essentially try and merge it into what we consider Zion, which they're just not the same thing because they don't understand that force coercion that is the tool and that's not that is the tool of the leftist ideology and for us the tool is the doctrine of christ faith repentance and basically voluntarily uh living a virtuous life and playing that song that allows for the perfect human relationships. So yeah, exactly. be on the lookout for that. <laughs> and you, you talked about um, the subversion of Christ and well, if the, the gospel of Christ could be spread in kind of a subversive manner and Rome didn't realize that loss until after it lost, same thing can happen with saying in his tactics and it can be just subversive and you can, you could lose and you do lose before realizing you do. It's a magic trick. The best magic trick is it happens before you start even looking for it. Yeah. And to bring it to a more practical level, this is what happened with gay marriage is I, well, I just did it. I called it gay marriage and you made mm -hmm. a video about this recently. Uh, that, that was implemented by activists to get the language changed, to start calling it that. And once you called it that the battle was won 
because then it's, well, why are we letting some people get married and other people not getting married? That doesn't make any sense at all. When before you change the definition, they were two different things. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's just a warning that Satan can uh, use those same subversive tactics and you lose before you even realize it. Well, and that, if I could say there's anything I'm doing on my channel is I'm trying to point to the subversive tactics that people aren't seeing. I'm trying to point out that the things that are masked as tolerance and inclusion and liberation and these kind of books like this, that you guys, this is part of a different gospel. This is part of a different way of viewing the world. It's not Zion. It's a counterfeit. And so many people are being seduced by it. And I think that the more we shine light on it, I think sunlight is the best disinfectant. When people can see what they're doing, then you wake up and you see it and you go, okay, no, you're not doing that. And I'm not going to allow this sort of manipulation and we're going to speak the truth and we're not going to lie. And um, we're going to be direct and honest and I think that is what creates the environment where these things die. Because, as Solzhenitsyn pointed out, that's kind of the way the Soviet thing happened was that people weren't willing to tell the truth. And when you stop telling the truth because people are manipulating you and telling you, we can't say that, it's mean, and, you know, and, and fine, there's a degree of that that's true. But when they're using that to silence the most like important truths, like they don't want you to point at what they're doing. Because if you actually point to what they're doing, then people are like, Hey, I see what you're doing here. And so people get really mad at me. And, and a lot of, and a lot of these people, and I think this is the same thing happened in the Soviet union. Like, isn't that these people were all like understood what was going on. They, they just, your average leftist is just like, I love people. I care about them. You know, like, Nuance Ho and these people, like they don't know what the heck they're talking about. They just are like, I want to be a good person. And they don't. And that's the problem. You don't understand that there are people that will take advantage of your good intentions and will use them to do terrible, terrible things. The Soviet revolution was based on good intentions. At least by the vast majority of people who gave power. Uh, if you get to like Lenin and Stalin, it's like, all right, yeah, they, yeah. Is, something and is I, a problem there. But and they I wouldn't have been able to do that without a lot of well-intentioned people giving them the the opportunity to do. Well, yeah, all and you go in, things. you go into the hardcore critical Marxists that really understand the theory. Like these people, full on believe in some stuff that's that we would consider false and evil things that they believe about human nature, about morality, and and they're on a totally different page. But your average person that listened to a professor who had been reading the hardcore Marxist and then incorporated that into the curriculum and then spun it in a way where we're just trying to make people equal. Well, you like equality, right? And they're like, yeah, I do. And it's like, <laughs> you, don't, you don't know what you're doing. And so mm -hmm. again, I, I think the more that we shine light on these things and resist it, and I'm pretty like people get kind of annoyed with me because I'm pretty rough with it. But the reason that I'm rough with it is because I I think these are some of the most dangerous and perverse and evil ideologies there are in existence. And I think I have the blood and body counts from the last century and, and other points in history to point this out. This is satanic stuff. And the problem is, is that if you don't, and I will use, I will use humor. I will use mockery. I will use scorn. I will use arguments. I will pull out everything I have in my arsenal to defeat things that are evil and wreak havoc on human well-being and flourishing. I'll do it. Like it's a fight. And then you have all these Latter-day Saints who are there like, don't be mean. Like, and I'm sitting here like, are you kidding me? You don't understand what's going on. You don't understand the stakes of the game. It's like they would chop off your child's penis if they had the chance. <laughs> like, when are we going to stop giving them the benefit of the doubt here? Yeah. I mean, although point, although I do give a lot of people the benefit of the doubt, but the ideology, my You're gosh. right. The, the the and that's the thing. You have and and that's my thing. I don't even I don't even judge the people that that are adhere to this ideology. They don't understand it. They're seduced, but because of the, they're actually seduced because they're good people. That's actually why they got seduced. 
If you're a really mm. good pe person, super high in compassion, but low in like rational faculties, you'll get sucked into this stuff in like two seconds. That's the game. And so it's like, that's why I'm so aggressive about it. And I think we all need to be aggressive about it because if we don't like if it prays, it, it, it literally is designed. These sorts of ideologies are designed to prey on your kindness. That's why I worry so much about Latter-day Saints because we're and nice. I worry people. so much about Latter-day Saint women, especially. Absolutely. They're, they're some of the sweetest, kindest, most compassionate, empathetic people ever. And like a parasite, this ideology grabs onto this stuff and then it manipulates you into thinking these things are compassionate when they're not. And, mm -hmm. you know, what could be, you know, it's like, yeah, we're going to help the poor people by using violent coercion to do it. And that nice Latter-day Saint mom would never use violent coercion on anyone. But they're able to convince her that, oh, it's, it's not really coercion. It's like, yes, it is. And that's why authoritarianism comes with a big smile on its face and, you know, the bureaucratic outfit. Like, I mean, I think a lot of us saw some of that during COVID and it kind of woke us up like, holy cow. Yeah. Like, some of these us. People, what these was people it? The, the Ronald nuts. Reagan quote. There's nothing scarier than a person in a suit at your door saying, hi, we're from the government. We're here to help. Exactly. There's a lot of truth to that. Well, anyway, man. Thanks so much Appreciate for it. staying up, staying it's up like late with me. my favorite topic. <laughs> yeah, I figured I figured you were the right guy to talk to about this stuff. Oh yeah, so. this is kind of the whole philosophy behind starting the Cougar Chronicle is to wake people up to some of this stuff that's happening at BYU, like at oh, places BYU's that Tizen Money goes to. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, it's a hot yeah, and then the battle's happening in our chapels. It's happening in BYU classrooms. It's happening out there on the streets. It's happening at our family dinner tables. And knowing this information, I think, then allows you to develop your strategy for confronting it. And I think you do that through questioning and subverting and spinning things on their heads and going with people to dig down into it. I'll give a very brief anecdote. Somebody on Twitter said, I'm going back to church for the very first time in a couple of years. And... I'm going to wear my pride pin when I go and that's going to like help me. And everybody was, you go girl, slay queen, all that, you know, that kind of stuff. And I, I responded and, and there were people saying mean stuff too. Like you should be excommunicated and all that stuff. And she wasn't deleting those comments, but she deleted my comments and blocked me. Why? Because I said, I love that you're coming back to church, but if I were you, I would not come with the extremely judgmental attitude of wearing a pride pin that says most of the people in this room here with me are uh, homophobic bigots and I'm judging you and broadcasting that and what you're wearing. And she, I mean, I'm not going to get into her head because it was a Twitter conversation. You know, we weren't face to face, but I think it was the being confronted with, dang it, they're using my, he's using my strategy against me. And I don't actually have a response to this because they are being extremely judgmental of church members who just want to uphold the family proclamation. Yeah. And there's not really any way to get around that. And so you can, then you realize, well, I can't, I can't take the moral high ground of saying other people are judgmental when they've pointed out I'm doing the same thing, possibly worse. And so then they just deleted the comments. Well, so I think point being, I once you understand the issues, you can start to, in in loving and specific spirit-guided ways, start to introduce these concepts to people through questions and discussion that can start to bring them around or at least be able to delineate the differences between you easier rather than just, oh, well, you're hateful and I'm not. Or yeah. you're judgmental and I'm not. Yeah, and I'm, yeah. and there's a one one thing with that that I, I always want to tell people, I... When it comes, like, if I actually want to convince you, Luke, I'm not going to argue with you. I'm not going to engage in, in, in that kind of discussion almost ever. Now, I'm not saying never, but if I want to influence someone, if you want to know if I'm actually trying to influence you, you'll find that I'm not arguing with you. I'm listening to you. I'm hanging out with you. I'm being around you. And I'm just being me. And my character 
will largely convince you. Now we may engage in some conversations, but I'm I, like, and that's what I call private ministry or direct ministry. Like I'm actually working with someone and that aspect of working to actually change someone's mind or opinions, you never do it directly. You never will, but you can indirectly. And the, the biggest space of indirect conversations is online today. And what happens is, is that what happens is that there's a public conversation that's going on and you come into it and you listen to someone's podcast or you, you, and, and they're not talking to you. They're talking to someone else, but your mind, you are open to, you'll change your opinion in that instance. Cause no one's telling you they're talking to someone else. And you think that guy made a good point. Right. And so I have these two realms, the realm of private ministry and the realm of public advocacy. And in our private ministry, we need to be loving, kind, listen, all that kind of stuff. But in our public advocacy, we need to pull out our muskets and we need to engage in the battle and battle hard. Because the idea is that in this realm, in the realm of ideas and us all discussing this online, I'm not, I'm not ever actually engaging with the person that I'm engaging with. I'm engaging with all the people that are watching us have the conversation. And those yeah. people who are watching, those are the ones who are going to watch and say, that was a good point. Or that guy wasn't able to define what a woman is or, you know, whatever. And all of a sudden, mm -hmm. whereas if I had gone to them and it attacked their view, they never would have listened. So we have to recognize, especially in today's world, there's the world of private ministry. That's incredibly important. It's a sacred thing. But there's also the world of public advocacy. And we have to be loud public advocates for the truth. And it's a battlefield. And I mean that in the realest sense. Like it's ugly, it's wild, but you got to win the battles. Because if you lose the battle in the public arena, in the, in the world of public advocacy, you'll lose the people that are watching that battle. And the cause of, the church and of Zion is hurt by that. And that's, that's like why I engage in the, in this and believe that it actually has some meaning is because not because I'm convincing the people that I have the interviews with, but because somebody watching will hopefully say, Oh, I get it. And they wouldn't have done that if I had gone to them and been like wagging my finger in their face. So yeah. I just think that's it's important. Kind of like a, a, a low risk, a low social risk scenario to listen to something like this instead of being directly confronted with it. Yeah. If I, if you come to me and are like, you're wrong about X, Y, and Z, I'm going to get all defensive and I'll be like, no, I'm not. Mm -hmm. I'm going to defend myself. But then mm -hmm. if I listen to you having a conversation, you just might change my mind. Cause I'm not, there's no ego in this. I'm just like an observer. And that's, that's super powerful. And people don't realize that, or they start to engage in public advocacy in the way that you do private ministry. They go in with someone who's a bad faith actor and they're being all nice and, oh, you know, and we can try and be civil. <laughs> we can try and be civil. I agree. You don't need to be like, but we need to attack the ideas aggressively and we need to destroy them because these ideas are cancer and they will lead to the worst things that can happen in, in the world. <laughs> they have. Mm -hmm. like, we don't have to guess at it. They have. So... Anyway, thanks for staying up late with me, man. It's later for you than it is for me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, but shoot, I've been talking a lot too. <laughs> you're pushing one in the morning. You need to get some sleep, man. Yeah. <laughs> All righty. Well, hey, thanks again, my friend. Appreciate it, Jacob. So do you enjoy the content here on Thoughtful Faith? If so, be sure to hit the notification bell. This ensures that our new videos show up on your feed. Also, be sure to check out our Facebook group called Thoughtful Saints, where myself and others discuss the sorts of topics found on this channel. And lastly, if you think other people would benefit from this video, please be sure to share it.